Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Turn with me to John chapter 8. I'm going to be reading verses 31 through 47 out of John chapter 8. Uh, and this is going to kind of be in a different direction than we've been going in, primarily because the Lord has really been ministering to me personally on what we're going to be talking about today. I'll see if I can do it without breaking down, but if I do, um, just break down with me, you know, don't, don't leave me alone in that. <laughs> So let's read this, John chapter 8, verses 31 through 47. Well, actually, let me give you some backstory real quick. This is after the Pharisees caught the woman caught in adultery. They caught this woman in adultery, and they were getting ready to stone her, and we know the whole story. We've we've talked about that story a lot uh, in this church, that when Jesus stood between those who were about to stone her and the woman, and he made him feel guilty in the best way possible, most pure-hearted way possible. (laughs) He just caused them to look at themselves and acknowledge their own sin. And at the time of acknowledging their own sin, they began to to leave their stones, and they didn't stone the woman. And then at that point, Jesus told her to go and repent. Change your life. Don't sin anymore. After that, Jesus starts kind of preaching to the Pharisees, and he's in his own way telling them that he's the Messiah, in his own way. He starts saying, you know, I'm the light of the world, starts talking about him and his father, different things like that. And the Pharisees could not understand him. They couldn't understand him. Everything that he was saying, the Pharisees would respond with a question. Some of you husbands know what I'm talking about. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Some of you, I mean, it's, it's a lot better, you know, whenever the husband talks, the wife asks a question. Whenever the wife talks, the husband doesn't listen. So <laughs> at, least, at least the Pharisees were listening. They just didn't understand. But Jesus was, was basically telling them, I'm, I'm the Messiah in his own way. He wasn't like gaudy about it or haughty about it. He was just, you know, this is who I am. And every time he would say, make some profound statement about who he was, the Pharisees would say, how can that be? We don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense. And this is where we arrive here in verse 31. He had actually, you know, if you read in verse 30, it says, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. But we'll find out that this is obviously not a heart belief that they came to have. It was more maybe a profession without the belief inside of their heart. But starting with verse 31, it says, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. 
They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father, they said to him. <clears throat> we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. <clears throat> I want you to understand again that he's talking to some Jews that had just said, we believe in you. In verse 30, it says, many came to believe in him. But then <laughs> we're reading this. It doesn't sound like they actually believed in it after that. So they made this confession, but there was nothing in their heart that changed, obviously. I mean, maybe there were some that actually changed, but the ones that Jesus continued to talk to, if you look in verse 31, it says, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. And then all, everything they say after this sounds like they still don't. This is, this is important. This is an important part. They had said, we believe, but obviously they didn't. Now, I want you to know that when Jesus is saying all of this to the Pharisees here about, you know, their father is the devil and the devil's the father of lies, he's not saying that they're inherently bad people. He's not saying you were born just bad people. You're always designed to be bad people. The devil was a murderer from the beginning and he's your father. You're just terrible people. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is you can't hear what I'm saying to you because your whole belief system is based on lies. You can't hear the truth. I speak the truth, but you can't hear it because you believe in lies. That's your father, the, the father of lies. <laughs> His offspring, just believe. I mean, if you believe a lie, you're, you're, you're trying to get grafted into his family. I'm telling you, that's what it means. Their whole belief system, their whole perspective is based on lies. And he said, that's why you can't hear the truth. Now, why would believing a lie cause you to not hear the truth? Well, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, right? That's not a verse about faith in God. That's a verse about faith. This is the power of faith. It gives substance to things hoped for, and it gives evidence to things not seen. So if faith is evidence, what happens when you put your faith in a lie? What is evidence? It proves. It's proof. You put your faith in a lie, and faith is evidence. What is that going to do to the lie? It's going to prove it to be true. It's going to provide proof for that lie. That's all the proof I need. Put my faith in a lie, it becomes truth. Are you with me? <clears throat> their whole belief system, everything they trusted, everything that their, even their teachings were built on was a lie. And Jesus, even at one point, another point with, in a conversation with them, he says, you, <laughs> you're looking for God and he's standing right in front of you. <laughs> you're looking in these in these words here for God, and he's standing right in front of you, and you can't see him. Why? Because they're, whole, they're blinded by lies. They're blinded by lies. Everything they believe based on lies. Now, I want you to know that there is such thing as absolute truth. I said you put your faith in a lie, it becomes truth. Do you believe that? Put your faith in a lie, that lie becomes truth. It comes truth to you, but not truth. There is such thing as absolute truth, amen? If you don't believe that, you're in the wrong place, okay? 
There is such thing as absolute truth, but once we choose to put our faith in a lie, it becomes truth to us. And once a lie becomes truth to us, it makes it that much more difficult to hear the absolute truth. Why would somebody leave a church when the truth is spoken? Because they're offended. Why would you become offended at the truth? Because it's not what you believe. You become offended at the truth, it means you believe a lie. The truth is offensive to untruth. It's offensive to lies. This is also why the more you choose to believe a negative lie about yourself, the harder it is to receive the opposite and encouragement from someone. In other words, if you believe you're just the ugliest person on the planet, it makes it a lot harder for people to tell you that you are beautiful, for you to receive it. Why? Because you put your faith in a lie. It became truth to you. Somebody speaks the actual truth to you because you are beautiful. Word says that. Someone speaks the actual truth to you. You can't receive it because your faith is in the lie that you are not. You hear me? Maybe you're dealing with chronic pain, chronic sickness, something that that Jesus came to destroy. I mean, it says he came to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil are sin. Sickness is a product of sin. I would say Jesus came to destroy sickness, wouldn't you? You feel like sickness is something you're supposed to live with, but you put your faith in that lie that you're supposed to live with sickness. Whenever someone comes to tell you that God can heal you, you don't believe them. Because your faith isn't in God, it's in the sickness. You hear me? Look at this. Look at verse 44. This is the only time this is ever said about the enemy. Verse 44, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. First of all, can you imagine? (laughs) I mean, that phone... (laughs) Perfect timing for that one. Can you imagine Jesus walking in here today and saying that to some of us? There are people, we don't, we we like to think there are not Pharisees in the church anymore. (laughs) We like to think that. Sometimes I I think that if we're the ones to think there are no longer Pharisees in the church, probably means we're the Pharisees. But if Jesus came in here today and said, you're of your father, the devil, man. Now, we're sitting there going, yeah, but it'd be Jesus, so I would receive it. Okay, whatever. (laughs) They didn't. (laughs) He says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This is who the enemy is. He's a liar and he's the father of lies. There is no truth in him whatsoever. He does not stand in truth. There is no truth in him. He is a liar and he's the father of lies. Extremely profound statement. I want you to know something. I'm going to be vulnerable with you. As a man in his 30s, who took over a church that was founded and, pastored, founded and pastored by a man for over 40 years. He never quit, pastored it the entire time. As a man in his 30s who took over a church like that, I'm well acquainted with the enemy's lies. Well acquainted. You're not good enough. You'll never be as good a pastor as Cliff. You'll always be misunderstood. People will not follow you. People will not trust you. You're not cut out for this job. You should quit. Shh. 
These are all lies the enemy has spoken to me. We took over in January of 2020. It is only September of 2022. In less than three years, the enemy has tried to demolish everything that I truly believe God wanted to do in me and with me by lying to me. Some lies told by people that were at one point in this house. I'm well acquainted with the enemy's lies. Pastors don't get a break from that. Jesus didn't get a break from that. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into a desert to be lied to by the enemy. It doesn't matter who you are. The enemy's gonna lie to you because it's who he is. It's who he is. He's a liar. In fact, let me just tell you, the enemy doesn't care who you are at all. He's going to lie to you. He's not, he's not scared enough to not lie to you. But I, I will say that the reason he is lying to you is because he's scared of you. I mean, what a cheap way to get out of a fight. I don't need to beat you, I just need to make you feel worthless. That's what he does. I mean, you, you read it, Genesis chapter three. How short was that conversation? Didn't take long at all. The enemy lied to them. I mean, he spoke some truth, but contextually, the enemy will always lie. Sometimes he'll use truth to lie to you. But he lied to them. He lied to them, and everything he, does, he did was done in deceit, and that was a short conversation. And every bit of life that was in man left him just because of a lie. I mean, he was a snake. He could have just bit him, you know? Decides to lie to him, get him, get him weak enough, and I don't even have to fight you. You'll just run away. Is it? The enemy doesn't even want you to not focus on God. That's not his goal. His goal is to get him to focus on yourself. He doesn't even want you to focus on him. He just wants you to look at you. Look how terrible you are. Look how worthless and hopeless and helpless you are. Look how ugly you are. Just look at you. This is what he did with Adam and Eve. You're not like God. Did God really say that you would die? You're not going to die. He just doesn't want you to be like him. Who are they looking at? <laughs> oh. Who did they look at after they sinned? Oh, that's all the enemy wants. This is why I believe the prophetic gift is so valuable in the church because lies tear people down. But the prophetic gift was meant to build up. This is why all the liars want to silence the prophetic gift in the church. Everybody who's bought into the lies of the enemy decided to believe them. People have put their faith in lies, want to silence the prophetic because it demolishes lies by building something up that a lie was designed to tear down. I, I have begun, begun rehearsing prophetic words spoken over me writing them down. I have them saved here in my phone, just reminding myself of things that the Lord has spoken to me. You guys heard the lies the enemy has spoken to me. I'm gonna combat those things with prophetic words, things that God has spoken to me. Yeah. I mean, even just simple stuff. 
last week um, after service, I'll call him out. You know, this is a prophetic word, I believe. All Adolfo did was come up to me and shook my hand, and he said, I'm glad you're my pastor. Amen. Prophetic word. I'm like, I'm going to write that one down. He's a liar. <laughs> the enemy's a liar. Here's what's really interesting, and I find it amazing about verse 44 when Jesus says that the enemy is a liar. The word liar here means one who falsifies, misinterprets, distorts, or misleads. Sorry, not misinterprets, misrepresents. Falsifies, misrepresents, uh, misleads, and distorts. Here's the truth about lies and about the enemy. He can't produce a lie unless there is a truth to misrepresent. The enemy cannot produce a lie unless there is a truth to misrepresent, a truth to falsify, a truth to distort. Yes. Oh. Truth can exist apart from lies, but lies cannot exist without the truth. This is, this is something that, that hit me when I feel like the Lord showed me this. If the enemy is lying to you, it is because there is a truth he does not want you to see. There is a truth he is keeping from you if the enemy is lying to you. I say the best thing you can do is if, you, if the enemy lies to you and you recognize it as a lie from the enemy, the exact opposite of it is the truth. The exact opposite of it is what he doesn't want you to know. If he says you're not good enough, that means God is saying you are good enough. If he is saying you will never have enough money, <laughs> you will never be able to make it, is because God is saying you will make it. A lie requires the presence of the truth in order to present itself. It requires the truth. That alone should be enough for us to just say amen and go home. But I'll keep it going for Dave. <laughs> I feel like our tendency is to just accept the lie. I know that it may seem obvious that if the enemy's lying to you, it's because he's trying to cover up a truth, but I think our tendency may be to just accept the lie without trying to discover the truth that it's veiling from us, that it's keeping hidden from us. We just kind of believe that lie without understanding that there is a reason behind why the enemy is lying to me. If he is telling me that I am weak, too weak, then it means that God is trying to tell me that I am strong enough. And we need to, to I begun to even see these things as an opportunity for revelation from God. Yeah. A lie is just an opportunity for God to be revealed. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> enemy, if you want to lie to me, go ahead, because you're just telling me what God is saying about me. Yeah. That's how I want to see it. But Jesus doesn't just call him a liar, he calls him the father of lies. This word father means originator, means lies, all lies, all untruth originates from the enemy. It does. It all originates from him. He's a father of lies. Here's, here's something that's really neat if you want to think about it this way. If, if the enemy is the father of lies, then this means that lies are his seed. Be blunt, it's the sperm of the enemy. 
It's a seed of the enemy. Lies. Now, what does the Word say God's seed is? The Word. You want to push back the seed of the enemy? Plant the seed of God. This seed, I don't care how weedy the seed of the enemy is, this seed will completely choke out every seed of the enemy. We like to, to see the seed of the enemy, those lies, that untruth is being a weed that can choke out other things, and it can, but when this seed is planted... Those other plants, the seeds of the enemy, can't stick around. So what is the enemy saying to you? And what does the word say? This is why it is so important that we know this. It is so important that we know this. In fact, look at verse 31. This whole passage here, Jesus starts it off. He says, it says, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, <laughs> then you are truly, are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus makes it clear here, truth does not exist apart from his word. He says, if you continue in my word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you continue in my word, not just knowing the word, but continuing in it, walking in it, then you will know it. It's not a knowing that happens up here. It's good to know it up here, but it needs to penetrate down here. And when it penetrates down here and I walk it out and I live it out, then I truly know the power of the word. There are many believers who know the power of the knowledge of the word, but have little experience in the word. Don't know the power of the experience of the word. And Jesus says that when we continue in it and carry it out and walk in it, then we know the truth. And then we can actually be free. If it's the truth making you free, what do you think the truth is going to set you free from? Lies. You know how easy it is to be intercepted by a lie of the enemy when all I have is the knowledge up here of the truth? Jesus, the only reason, I guarantee you, The only reason Jesus was able to beat back the enemy in the desert when the enemy was lying to him is not because he had head knowledge of the word, but because of his willingness to live it out. Knowing scripture up here is not enough. It's not heavy enough ammo for the lies that the enemy will throw at us. It comes from a willingness to be conformed and transformed by it, conformed to it and transformed by it. That ultimately will be heavy enough ammo to be able to to beat back those lies. We have to know this. I mean, when, when we were youth pastors, we spent so much time talking to the teens about this. Because I'm not saying it's wrong, but we, we, just, we just decided at one point, we just are tired of our teens just having a fun experience. And like getting to know God on an emotional level. It was just like, we just need to teach him how to truly change. It's right here. So we would say this all the time. We'd say, pick up the spoon. Feed yourself. I don't care if you're teenagers. You're old enough. You can feed yourself. Go home. Open this thing. Let it feed you. Let it nourish you. Let it change you. We have to know this. Not just up here, but in here. Let the seed of God's word be planted into the soil of your heart. Don't be thorny soil. Don't be rocky soil. 
Let it change you. Now, kind of a different direction here. Sometimes the lies of the enemy will not just keep you from the good things, the positive things that God wants to say to us, the affirming things. Sometimes the lies of the enemy are going to keep us from knowing things in us that need to change. I think it's really popular nowadays for anybody to get up on a platform at a church and say, hey, you guys are great. You're not doing anything wrong. Everything's fine. That'll attract a large crowd. It will. It's it's crazy, though, that, that that has become a thing because that's not even really the way that Paul talked most of the time in his letters. That's like <laughs> almost the entire Bible is, is God just reminding us, hey, don't forget about the things in your heart that I want to change. And sometimes the enemy will be like, oh, you're good. You're fine. Don't worry about it. It's okay. You don't need to change anything. You know, you've had a rough day. You don't need to go to church. I mean, he's going to look, he's going to pick up anything that he can to either keep, well, he's, what he's doing ultimately is just keeping the word of God from us. He's trying to anyway. He's trying to keep the truth. Truth is supposed to set us free, not just make us happy. Right? Right? And we can, we can actually see this happen right here. Look in, uh, <clears throat> oh, after he says that, verses 31 through 33, whenever Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And then they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? You know how crazy this is? We've never been enslaved to anyone. (laughs) Okay, Egypt, Babylon, Syria, Persia, even while this is being said, Rome? Really? (laughs) See, this is what the enemy will do sometimes. He'll whisper these little lies and be like, I've never been enslaved to anyone. (laughs) I'm good to go. It sounded like Barney Five, didn't it? <laughs> I'm good to go, you know. <laughs> that's that's kind of like what it sounds like, you know, whenever we're letting the enemy lie to us that way. <laughs> but but seriously, like they're just completely oblivious to, I mean, the towers of Rome looming over them, looking at, down on them. We've never been enslaved to anybody. What do you mean we can be free? <laughs> we are free. That sounds like you know, a good portion of the church today. I'm going to heaven. I don't got to worry about anything. That's all I need is that reward at the end of the tunnel. (laughs) Get rid of my torch now because the light's at the end of the tunnel. That's what I need. I don't need a light in the tunnel. I just need the light at the end of it. I don't need God to reveal anything going on in me right now. This just, it just, it boggles my mind. This is how deep they were in their deception and the deception of the enemy. This is how deep they were in lies. They couldn't see what was happening right in front of them, let alone who was in front of them. They couldn't see what was happening all around them. They couldn't see it. And it's because they had put their faith in lies. Everything they believed based on lies. The enemy's a liar. That's all he is and all he ever will be. We can't let him lie to us in any way. I know how many of us don't want to let him lie to us in a negative way but we also need to make sure he's not lying to us in an affirming way. We have to make sure we are looking at both sides here because he will lie. Amen? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16.
I'm going to read verses 21 through 23. Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23. I love that I can hear all those pages turning. That's amazing. Starting with verse 21, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. How many of you have headings in your Bible? Yeah. The heading of this one says, in mine anyway, Jesus foretells his death. Look at the heading in the passage before that. <laughs> Peter's confession of Christ. <laughs> I mean, how, how, how long ago was this? Eight verses? Eight verses, this whole confession? I mean, the confession was less than that. And then... Now Peter's like, Jesus is like, hey, guys, I got to go die. <laughs> I'm going to go hand myself over. I'm going to be taken. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to die. I'm going to experience some extreme pain. You know, all of that stuff. Peter says, God forbid it. You can't do this. Jesus turns to him. I don't, I don't, I don't believe he actually looks him in the eye. I don't think he could. That'd be hard. I can imagine, though, like maybe looking down with his eyes closed and putting his hand up in Peter's face or something like that. But he yells. There's an exclamation point there. It wouldn't. Get behind me, Satan. You know why he's yelling? He's sick and tired of the enemy. He's like, you've been doing this over and over and over. You keep lying to me and saying things to me that I don't really care to hear, that I don't need to hear, and that are just lies. None of it is the truth, and I'm sick and tired of your games. Get behind me. Stop lying to me. Stop just, I mean... If, if they were words, shut up. Yeah. He's not happy about this. <laughs> it's, he, this is what he says to, to Satan. He says, you are not interested in what God wants. You're only interested in what man wants. Great way to tell if it's a lie from the enemy. Is it in the interest of God or man? Is it in God's interests or man's interests? Rarely, if at all, is God going to will something that is just only in my interest. I don't even know if He will. I, 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 don't, I don't know that, but I do know <laughs> that God wants what he wants. And that's not going to change, period. It's just not going to change. He wants what he wants, regardless of what I think about it or my opinion or what I want. He just wants what he wants. I mean, the, the enemy can show you his hand if you realize that the thing that is being said to you is more in your interest than in God's, if the thing that is being said to me is more in the interest of man than it is of God's interests, it would be that the, the lies that I shared with you earlier that the enemy has shared with me, they were all in man's interests. Because they were all based on this body would be better without you, Josh. This church would be better without you as pastor. They don't trust you. They could use somebody else. I mean, honestly, those are not based on God at all. But here's the other thing. How close were Peter and Jesus? 
How close were they? They were really close. I mean, Jesus isn't going to hand his church off to a stranger. They were close. And the enemy knows that he can use people close to you to lie to you. God forbid it. You can't do this. Lie. He will use people close to you to lie to you. It doesn't mean that they always have evil intentions in lying to you, but he will use them to lie to you because he knows you are more likely to believe somebody who's close to you standing right in front of you than you are him sometimes. And in this moment, it's like his last ditch effort. I'm going to use Peter, the one that just confessed that he is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. I'm going to use him to lie and keep him from going through with this plan. And Jesus says, no. I don't care if it's coming out of the mouth of Peter. It's a lie from the enemy. I had a dream about 10 years ago. A really good friend of mine at the time, I, I was in, in my dream, I was laying on my couch and, and I saw, it was a dark room, kind of dimly lit, and I saw in my dream this good friend of mine. I mean, we were really close. He was like a big brother to me. Uh, he walks into this room in my dream. I'm just laying on the couch and he points his finger at me and he starts saying, you aren't good enough. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be good enough for your family or your friends. You'll never be good enough for anyone that you're going to be with ever. Anybody that's in your life, you're never going to be good enough. You'll never accomplish what it is that God wants you to do. You will never, ever do those things. And as he's saying these things, he's backing back into the hallway that he came from until he just kind of disappears in the darkness, just continues speaking these lies. <clears throat> I woke up and I immediately knew that's not God. <clears throat> I immediately knew that's not God, but he wanted, the enemy thought, I can use the image of somebody that he trusts. I can use the image of somebody that he trusts to try and convince him. But it was so, it was so like the enemy, even in the dream as he's lying to me, he's backing up. <laughs> That's exactly what the enemy does. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be good enough for them, for him, for her. You're just not going to. He's backing up. Why? Because he's afraid. He doesn't want to get yelled at. <laughs> just here recently. I'm very recently, somebody that I used to be in a relationship with, <clears throat> close friend, sent me a text message just out of nowhere. He never talks to me and just out of nowhere sends me a text message and this is what he says. Josh, I was just praying for you and I feel like God wants to say to you that the pastor thing is just not your gig. That's so what he said. He said, the pastor thing is not your gig. He said, I feel like you've been sidelining your dreams in film because you feel like you have to be in ministry. The pastor thing is not your gig. You think with the lies that the enemy has been saying to me, that seems a little bit obvious? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> yeah, he did say that. He said, he said, you're, you think you're in ministry, but really you're just in bondage. <laughs> Get behind me! I'm sick of that junk! I'm just done! I'm done being pummeled in that way, being lied to. I'm done with you being lied to. It has no place in my ears or in my thoughts. None. 
I'm like, You're, he's just an idiot. Isn't he just an idiot, the devil? I, I'm okay calling him. A lot of people like to say, oh, he's crafty and smart. You know, when, when God cursed the enemy in the garden, he said, cursed are you more than all cattle. You know what that word cattle means? Dumb beasts. He says, you're more cursed than the dumbest beast on the planet. You know what that means? He's pretty dumb. I'm not going to give him the glory of being intelligent. Are you serious? Moment I do that, he becomes pretty smart. But in this moment, I was like, this is stupid. This is just dumb, as dumb as it comes. But I'm, I'm still, I don't care if it's stupid, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of, of him lying to me. I'm tired of him lying to you. <clears throat> and it's who he is. I know it. But there is a truth and a revelation of God that the enemy wants to keep you from that you need to hear and you need to know. I, we'll just, we won't turn there for the sake of time, but I want to close it out. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul's writing to the Corinthians, and I want you to know something that was going on in the Corinthian church is there were people in this church who were trying to divide the rest of the church against him. This is something we talk about all the time. And in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of strongholds. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This whole statement was made by Paul in response to his critics, in response to lies that were being told about him, and it was probably in response to lies that were being told to him by the enemy. I can't imagine hearing things said about you and spoken about you that were not true, that the enemy would not use those things and begin to lie to you too. <clears throat> but this is a militant stance that Paul took against everything that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God, the truth. Every lofty thing that, that man's reasoning can come up with. And the enemy will use that. He's gonna lie to you and your reasoning and make you think things that actually aren't true. He's gonna plant little ideas. We've talked about this before, about eight months ago, about pulling down strongholds, letting him lie to us and then building on that idea with our own reasoning. Don't even let that lie be planted in the soil of your mind, lest you begin building on top of that thing. But he says, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is a very militant message. Taking captives. I am going to take things from the enemy and bring them under my control. Yes. You're not going to control my thoughts. I'm going to take captive those thoughts, keep them under my control. I'm going to decide what I think. You're not going to tell me what to think. I'm going to choose to think the truth. I'm going to choose to think about what God says, not about what the enemy says. And he says, to the obedience of Christ, literally meaning I'm going to force those thoughts into submission to the authority of Christ. Not just the authority of Christ, but the obedience of Christ. The lies that can keep you from walking out this word, the lies that can keep us from carrying out his word, keep us from the truth and living that way that way. But I'm going to force those thoughts into submission to Jesus. Who's Jesus? He's the Word. I'm going to force those thoughts into submission to this right here. <clears throat> I believe that the reason the nation, our nation is being held captive by lies is because the church is being held captive by lies. I mean, you can speak the truth all you want, but if you're living in the liar's camp, <clears throat> what good is speaking the truth in the liar's camp going to do? You're held captive in lies. You can say things that sound true, but it's not true to you. 
There's a church, there's a body in America that is being held captive by lies. I mean, witchcraft, if you want to call it that. By lies. And this is why our nation is being lied to. Because we were supposed to be the bulwark. We're supposed to be the bulwark and the stronghold that protects our country and our nation from lies. But we've given ourselves over to them now, and so it's like, that's why our nation's being lost. We've seen, I mean, you've seen it. We've heard about it. We've read about it. Churches giving in to things that are not theologically sound. And people still screaming, saying, it's not about theology. Listen, it is. We don't worship theology, but you got to be sound. <laughs> it needs to be truth. You can't start saying lies just because you want more people in your church. Just, this is not based, you say like, well, it's all based on a desire to love people. No, it's really based on, a, on an unwillingness to be unpopular. I'm not going to shake up the truth and change the truth because I love people. That's because I don't want to be unpopular. But it's crazy. Bailey was pointing this out to me. How many of you married men know your, your wife is there to not to just call you out on stuff, but to point out things in you that maybe God's saying to you that you need to hear? She revealed this to me. She said, you know, you're talking a lot about the lordship of Jesus and, here the, and, and about also about uh, not just forsaking the truth for, for popularity. And here the enemy is pummeling you with lies that people don't like you, don't trust you, don't love you, won't follow you, things that make you unpopular. <laughs> She's basically saying the enemy knows that you're hitting on something that needs to be said, that needs to be spoken, and needs to be walked in, and he doesn't want you to say it anymore. My dad and I were talking about this. <clears throat> you preach on the lordship of Jesus, the enemy's gonna try even harder to be lord. You preach on Jesus needs to be lord of your life, the enemy's gonna try even harder to be the lord of your life or to make you the Lord of your own. But I mean good or bad, positive or negative, affirming or tearing down, we cannot let the lies of the enemy become truth to us anymore. None. It is time to stop believing those things and to start allowing his truth and his word to be deeply planted in the soil of your heart and to push out those things that are killing you and poisoning your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, and your soul. We have to allow him to be planted in us, this. So this is my encouragement. How about start by reading this? Read this. And also, Paul tells Timothy, don't just read it to show yourself approved. Study it. There's a difference between reading and studying. Well, I read my chapter for the day. <laughs> okay, well, what did it do? That's like taking a picture of your food instead of eating it. Study it, dig into it, ask God, what do you want me to have out of this? What are you saying? What are you showing me? Because I want it to be a part of me. And communicate with him, converse with him, commune with him, talk to him, let him talk to you, let him feed you and pour into you. And you will notice these lies that the enemy tells you just kind of start to fizzle out. Amen? All right, stand with me. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Kotz. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.